um, <clears throat> we have a fairly light agenda here today, but um, I think we have uh, uh, one proposal. And, and I, Todd, you said we weren't going to vote. I think this is just the initial presentation, right, of the project reporting proposal. Yeah, I believe so. Tracy, um, were you were you looking to bring this to vote today, or is this more just discussion at this point? I think just discussion at this point. Um, okay. You know, I think just to enjoy it. Uh, yeah. And also, uh, Tomash and Sheehan have joined, so we are actually at quorum at this point. We're at quorum. Okay, well, if, if everybody is comfortable, we can also vote on it then. Great. Perfect. So, um, on the agenda today, we have Hackfest. Uh, planning and just a reminder of what's going to happen uh, uh, next week. And um, some of us are about to jump on planes to and trains and automobiles to get out there. Um, I want to just talk briefly about our drive uh, within the Hyperledger Fabric uh, team to uh, to 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 1.0. Um, Tracy is going to present a proposal for doing project reporting and. Uh, the template that she's cooked up. And then um, Dave is going to regale us with where we stand with the uh, plans to have uh, Hyperledger um, sponsored security audit pen testing process that all the projects can use as they get ready to do a, a major release. Uh, are there any other topics for the agenda? Okay, if not, Todd, you wanna? Sure thing. Uh, so the Hackfest is going well. We'll be Monday and Tuesday next week in Beijing. Uh, we actually have almost 150 registered for that now. So uh, most popular Hackfest to date. Really excited to see the momentum there. If you are planning to attend, please register as soon as possible. Um, that was in the agenda that went out. Uh, there is also a wiki. It looks like Bao Hua just posted that into the chat window. Um, we will run this similarly in the unconference format. Um, Brian will get things kicked off on Monday with some discussion, and then we will have uh, some whiteboards and post-its and whatnot to call for topics that people want to either present on or just discuss in general, and we'll get that all laid out uh, over the course of the two days. Any questions there before we talk about future Hackfests? All right, well, we're looking forward to seeing everyone there. Uh, on the future Hackfest, uh, a lot of people have already responded um, regarding the uh, upcoming U.S. Hackfest looking at August or September. Right now, it's looking more likely uh, for September, but please uh, uh, go fill out the doodle poll I just dropped into the chat window. Uh, we'd like to finalize on this pretty quickly here so that folks can book travel around that. Uh, and then looking beyond that, um, I think last week we were potentially floating the idea of Europe in October-ish time frame. Um, interested if there are any thoughts around that. Otherwise, we can put out a separate doodle poll to try to hone in on something there. If um, the U.S. one shifts into September, will the European one move out from uh, October? Or will it stay to give a more of a two-month cadence? I think we're flexible. We can look at October and, and November and kind of see what works for folks. Um, but really, what's going to work best for this this community is what we'll do. Okay, because I'm not opposed to Oktoberfest in Germany. I mean, October in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually in September, though. <laughs> nice. I don't know why they call it Oktoberfest, because it happens in September. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else, Todd? Did do we know if there are any prospective sponsors? Have you? So we have uh, chatted with a few companies that can potentially host. Um, there are actually a couple in Chicago that we're interested in hosting. Um, mm. We could also look at uh, New York, Boston, uh, that as well. So any of the folks on the call, if you have office space that could accommodate a hackfest, please get in touch with me as soon as possible. Kidoke. Thanks, How many are we expecting? Uh, I would say for the U.S. one, probably 80, 80, 80, 90, something like that. Okay. Let me see what we can do. It's all for me.
All right. Excellent. Thanks, Todd. Okay. Um, next up is Hyperledger Fabric 1.0 and the drive to getting it done. Um, uh, just uh, as a brief update, basically, um, we, we cut our beta release uh, last week. We had intended to do weekly cadence releases, um, and uh, we had a, a discussion yesterday afternoon, um, uh, and uh, we, we sort of felt that we weren't quite there with, you know, the timing for another release. There wasn't quite enough in it. Um, so we were hoping to get some of the uh, security bugs fixed in time um, and uh, get some of the documentation improved um, and uh, <clears throat> get the new process for publishing the binaries and, and sample apps um, uh, sorted out. But that didn't happen. Um, so I think we're pushing that off to next week and then we'll have another decision point on Wednesday um, as to whether or not we think we're ready for a release candidate or not, um, uh, or we're with, whether we do a beta two. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, a lot, a lot of that will obviously be predicated on, you know, where are we with uh, the open defect count? And what's the rate of things coming in, uh, defects coming in, and, and so forth. Um, it's getting a lot of uptake. Um, uh, the, the beta that, that's out there, um, it's been out for, um, um uh, well basically a week today um uh, today with the last day of the week and we have about 400 downloads so that's actually very positive um and um uh so anyway so so that's sort of where we're at there's you know a few things you know from a process perspective we've um uh, we've established a set of um exit criteria that the fabric team is going to be looking at um, uh, for its, uh, you know, 1.0, uh, others can feel free to beg, borrow, and steal that if they'd like. Um, it's out on the wiki under the Fabric project. Um, and um, uh, and, and um, we're also, um, uh, you know, in, it's starting to engage with some of the various license and crypto export scans and so forth, uh, working with Tracy and Dave on um, on, on those aspects of things and obviously those things have to happen um, and then uh, you know obviously we, we for, for some of the um, uh, non Apache 2 licensed dependencies um, because we're using go and because you vendor the go code the way that you do with go we have to ask uh, for um, uh, we have to ask the board for an exemption and um, so anyway, so I just wanted to sort of let people know that this is happening um, and that, you know, as we push towards the next few weeks that uh, the Fabric team will certainly be um, uh, pretty busy and, and you know, uh, welcome any, anybody wanting to come in and kick the tires. And then hopefully once we're past that, you know, we can focus a little bit more on, uh, you know, some of the things that I know everybody wants to do, you know, we'd like to spend some quality time, you know, looking at Poet, um, and we'd like to spend some quality time, certainly with Burrow, um, on integration of the EVM as chain code uh, and, and various other uh, things. And, and uh, so hopefully once we're past this, we can, we can start doing some of that in earnest. So I just want to give people an update. That's sort of where we're at. And uh, hopefully we get something done in the next month or so. Hey Chris, are you seeing an influx of additional issues showing up now that uh, that it's in a beta and and you've had you know this 400 downloads? Yeah, now that we're in beta, we're getting a lot more um, external bug uh, reports coming in. Um, I mean, that's not a that, that's actually a good thing because it means it's people, yeah. it, right? <laughs> it's not great from a quality perspective, obviously, but um, we are seeing an influx of um, uh, defects coming in from outside as well as the, you know, the, the increased testing that um, we're putting on it, uh, adding daily and weekly and additional unit and, and integration tests as we're doing. Um, uh, and so, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's not just people downloading it and then throwing it away. They seem to be using it and coming back 
And I also noticed that the questions in the chat seem to have increased in, as well, and, and they're fairly substantive. So I think it's all a good sign. Cool. Very cool. Could you say a little more on the, the uh, non-Apache 2 dependency issue? Yeah, so we're using Go, as you know, for Fabric and Fabric CA in particular. Um, and the way that you have to deal with dependent, well, with, with Go, the dependencies need to be in the Go path um, when you build your binaries. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, there's, I guess there's two ways we could do it. We could ask everybody that ever wanted to build to go and install you know, 50 or 100 or whatever it is, number of dependencies uh, in, in their environment uh, so that they can build it. Um, or you can vendor the dependencies. And this means just like with Node or, um, you know, some, uh, you know, with Maven, we, we, there's a dependency tree that can be um, included in your repository. Um, but Go doesn't provide a means of dynamically creating this, unfortunately. Um, and so, they're, they're actually working on, on addressing this, but that fix, this new dependency management uh, tool, GoDep, isn't going to be um, uh, in, a, in a place where it can be used for, um, uh, for, for projects that are serious about things until um, probably Q4 of this year, they say. Um, <clears throat> and so, we, in, in our source tree, we actually include the vendor tree of all the Go dependencies that we have for the two projects. Some of those dependencies are MIT or BSD or MPL licensed. And so for those, we have to go up and, and ask Mother May I to uh, proceed. It's not any of the code that we include uh, other than the vendor dependencies and the vendor dependencies, again, they're not modified by us in any way. We just um, you know, we just download them and, and stick them in there. Um, and so I've been working with Tracy and with Steve Winslow on um, uh, on, on uh, reconciling some of those things, and then we'll pull together a proposal for the board. Uh, I was hoping that we could get one done, but there was another scan done, and uh, it's it's like swatting flies. <laughs> so there's a few more things I have to address that didn't get licenses put on them, unfortunately. So. Anyway, um, so, so that's sort of the situation, Dan. It's, it's not like we're, you know, um, including other licensed stuff or putting other things in that have a different license. It's, it's really just those vendor dependencies. Once we get past this and start using GoDep, we should be able to manage it just like, you know, NPM or, uh, or Maven and, and have it automatically recreate on build the, uh, the set of dependencies that you need to use. Okay, the, thanks. That, that helps they won't be get more context. Right, then they won't be in the source tree. All right, I'm uh, done. Then next up then would be Tracy. Well, thanks, Chris. Uh, so just past week, I put on the TSC mailing list a proposal uh, for project reporting specifically to keep the TSC informed of what is happening with the, the different projects that fall under the Hyperledger umbrella uh, and, and to make sure that there's some oversight um, that exists uh, with the community and the code that's happening. Um, you know, for example, our, our regular release is happening. Are, are we getting diversity of developers, uh, contributors joining, and, you know, those sorts of things. So the, the proposal is really um, to have the project maintainers report on their project's health and status monthly to the TSC. Uh, and so with that, I've created a template um, that can be used for that reporting where each, uh, each month the, the project is designating a maintainer to create that report. And then the maintainer or the designated maintainer would actually uh, fill out that report and um, include it to be uh, reviewed by the TSC on a monthly basis. 
And so the contents of that template are really just uh, what is the, the project that we're reporting on? Uh, what is the health of that project? Uh, you know, summarizing uh, really, you know, is the, is the community uh, healthy? Are questions being answered? Are contributors acting appropriately? Um, and then do we have new contributors showing up? Any issues that might exist that, uh, you know, need to be brought to the attention of the TSC uh, so that they can either specifically address them or just be aware of them. Uh, and then, you know, what releases have happened in the last month, uh, because regular software releases are a sign of a healthy project. Um, and so the next one would be the overall activity that's happened in the past month. Uh, so is any new development happening or are we just doing bug fixes? Uh, you know, what's the, the technical changes that the project is actually working on? Uh, and then, you know, what are the current plans? So are, are the current plans really to uh, add new features? Uh, when are those features going to be planned? Uh, really thinking more about uh, what the roadmap for that project is and, and how, that's, uh, how that's working, right? Uh, and then if the activity is, is minimal, we, we need to discuss uh, are there plans to address that or are we uh, looking to actually take that to uh, more of a deprecated or end of life state. Um, and then the next question really is around the, the maintainers and the, the contributor diversity. So when were maintainers last at it? Um, and are we getting new contributors to the project? And then lastly, uh, call for any additional information that the project uh, reporter might feel is important for the, the TSC to be aware of. Um, and so really just a, a short questionnaire um, that would be public on the wiki uh, and would be reviewed by the, the TSC. Uh, and, and I suggested that uh, maybe the first uh, meeting of the month is, uh, is the right time to have that review of, of the projects. So uh, happy to have discussion on that and, and see uh, what the TSC thinks. Any questions, comments for Tracy? So I had, I had one, um, and that <clears throat> that's the the frequency of, of these uh, reports. And I tend to, I mean, and I, it was it was funny, you know. So we also put out a, you know, brief blurb on, you know, how things are going for each of the projects currently, and uh, Todd or Min, you know bundles them up and puts them into the, the board um, <clears throat> uh, update so that we can present sort of how things are going to the board. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, uh, and, and then there's some derivative of that that gets, you know, munched up and, and Jessica puts out a, a blog post to sort of give the broader uh, community an update on how things are going. Um, and I, I know, you know, Dan, <laughs> You know, it was like, geez, I thought I just did one of these, you know, and it just, it, it's, it is pretty frequent. And, um, and sometimes there's not a whole lot to talk about, or it's really just more of the same. We're testing and fixing bugs or whatever. And so <clears throat> I think that, you know, maybe monthly is a little bit too frequent and maybe quarterly would be something, you know, because then, you know, uh, there's, uh, ability to sort of spot trends and so forth and um, uh, and the other aspect of it is we could spend a little bit more quality time um, at, in the TSC actually reviewing them and we could even uh, you know it, it you know we could even have it so that it's not that everybody does it every quarter but that you know we stagger them so that there's not a, a gazillion of them that we have to go through um, so I think they do that in other organizations. So I, I just, you know, get your thoughts on whether you think that, you know, having less frequently than monthly could still achieve the same objective of being able to sort of track how things are, are going. Yeah, I, I kind of second that before uh, um, Tracy has a chance to think about that for a minute. <laughs> but uh, I, I know I do end up doing a, a decent amount of status reporting uh, for, a variety of things, uh, including this project that 
I'm not sure how much they get read. So uh, I, I would prefer to be putting time into, you know, creating capabilities more so than reporting. So I'd want to you know, be able to balance some of that. So this kind of expands, this, this template kind of expands beyond what we had been doing for reporting. So it, it increases that amount of time. So if we could cut back on the frequency or, or cut back on the scope of it, that would be good. And, you know, the other thing, and, and I, 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 I reflect, I mean, because I have, you know, the sort of the same problem. I have a lot of things I have to tell a lot of people about, and it's unclear exactly how much value there is in all of that. But one of the things that I think is um, worthwhile is trying to figure out how can we automate some of the uh, aspects. And some of the, you know, you can't automate, well, I mean, you know, maybe you could with some of the uh, machine learning kind of stuff that we have now. but. Um, you, you can't necessarily automate, you know, uh, how things are going on the mailing lists and whether people are arguing with one another. I guess, again, we probably could do something there. But um, certainly, um, uh, you know, just the, the project diversity, right? How many engineers from how many different companies or how many different constituencies are uh, involved in the project? Um, you know, from a month-to-month -month perspective, who's who's landing commits, who's doing reviews, um, all of that stuff leaves. A, there's a paper trail that we can actually harvest, and and um, you know, we can get Baturgia or somebody to come up with numbers that tell us how things are going from from that perspective. And certainly, you can, you know, we can we can uh, we can measure releases uh, pretty easily. So I'm just curious if you know, if there's any way that we could simplify some of this that we're collecting um, by just being able to reference that there's a report or, you know, a dashboard or something that people can look at to see how diverse projects are and so forth. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's Leonard, uh, it's, because you stole the word out of my mouth, dashboard. We do have the making of a dashboard in terms of how the different projects are reported and the dependency. It's just um, everything you've said. I'm just wondering if we can extend that dashboard to provide you know, these additional metrics that everybody would be interested in. So it would be available on a daily or monthly basis. So we don't have to wait every three months to provide the portal. Because then, if it's all um, integrated into the dashboard, people can have annual uh, sort of views whenever they want. However, we could look and see how different projects projects are progressing or not progressing and then these forward for early review just based on what we see from the dashboard. So that's always a good approach in automating as much as we can. Sorry about the noise in the background, but no, I certainly would support you on trying to automate as much as we can using what we already have in place. Uh, sorry, Tracy. Oh, no problem. No problem. I, I appreciate the additional thoughts. So uh, definitely, we are working on metrics. Uh, so let's let's maybe take that off the table because that is going to be another discussion at some point. Um, we are definitely working with Petergia. I am also doing some scripting to to pull information from each of the projects. So that will definitely be happening as well. Um, so so maybe we can focus on kind of the uh, timing and the um, those kind of questions and concerns that people have, right? Um, so. You know, I, I think the, the question becomes, you know, if we, there's concern that uh, people wouldn't be looking at these reports, right? And and so that's why I wanted to make the, the last step of this really the running it through the TSC and making sure that the TSC is, is really uh, aware of what's going on, right? So it's that there has to be uh, people who are looking at these things and not just we're reporting for the sake of reporting because I, I think you're exactly right um, reporting for that just for the sake of making uh, putting something down on paper really isn't useful but um, when you're doing it to make sure that a project is healthy and uh, should continue as a project under the hyperledger umbrella um, that's where I think the value comes in so uh, you know I I think as far as timing goes, the reason that I chose monthly uh, was, Chris, kind of for the, the reasons that you stated, right, which are um, that we are really doing these monthly uh, reports for uh, the blogs and for 
uh, sending out information to the the governing board and those sorts of things. Uh, and so I was trying to uh, tack on to that schedule such that you wouldn't have to do multiple reports. It could be a single report that is used for multiple purposes, right? And those purposes being, uh, you know, the TSC being able to understand the project health, uh, the governing board being able to understand what's happened in, in the last month and, and see the progress that the different projects are making. Uh, and then also to be able to report out to the larger community um, just what's ongoing. Uh, so that's why I chose monthly. Um, you know, I I don't really myself have a particular um, uh, dog in this fight, I guess you can say, right? I, I think that, um, you know, there, like you said, when, if, when we bring these metrics in, we'll be able to see a lot of the, the health of the projects and, and see what's going on. Uh, so, you know, I, I will leave that up to the TSC as a, a decision point as far as the timing that they think is appropriate. Uh, if it's a staggered schedule, um, you know, that's that's another option, right? So, uh, but really keep in mind that I was trying to uh, use this for more than just the one purpose and, and bring in those other things, because I think you'll still be asked for those reports for the governing board. Uh, you'll still be asked for reports for um for the the blog and those sorts of things so um you know keep that in mind as you're as you're thinking about this hey this is brian i didn't don't want to step on anyone else from the tsc who wants to also comment but i wanted to get something out that uh um uh, I feel is important for us to think about, which I wrote into the the comments. But for those who are just calling in and not not connected through GoToMeeting, um, I said I felt like the TSC shouldn't really be focused on what can be automated or uh, is easiest to collect. Um, it really needs to think about its oversight role um, over the projects. Uh, you know, I'm I've been fighting really hard <laughs> to preserve the TSC as the the center of technical governance for the project um, and to try to keep. Um, both the Linux Foundation and uh, um, the governing board from feeling like it has to step in and, and do that. Um, just because, you know, these projects should be predominantly about, you know, uh, pushing forward technology and community at the same time. And the developers really should be the, the center of gravity for deciding if people are doing what they should be doing. Um, so, so I think we should be thinking about what does the TSE need to know about a project how how often does it need to know about that? If a project has gone gone quiet, which is the more likely scenario than a project getting getting into a, a tense you know fight or something like that, I think we'll know about that as soon as it happens. But the bigger risk is a project kind of goes moribund, and and if we have too many of those kind of sitting out there, um, does that reflect poorly upon the project? Reflect poorly upon the TSC? Um, you know, mature and stable and Cutting a, a, a release once in a while to, to sweep up bugs is fine, uh, but if it were unresponsive to security notices or not bringing in, um, not not responding to pull requests or bringing in new developers when uh, when they show up at the door, then that's a problem, right? Um, and that's what the TSC should be, and I believe is empowered to monitor for and and step in uh, if if there's problems there. And so that's really what should drive the question of what do we want reported and how often. Yeah, uh, this is Leonard. I do agree um, wherever uh, the speaker goes, um, that degree of governance and the TSC um, or how I say, intertwined. <laughs> so yes, the, the level of reporting um, to uh, to our executives and uh, within the uh, organization is very important. So yeah, they need to determine uh, the frequency of these reports. And as Tracy said, the month we the at the start because all organizations work on a monthly basis. And um, yeah, but it, it has to provide pertinent information. Information that's pertinent to the TSE, so they can um, basically measure whether governance is working in the heart. 
And secondly, if it's of interest, that's of value to the exec, if they were to pass on that report or if it were demanded of them. So yeah, I totally agree with what Chase has. And don't forget, it's always continuous improvement. You start at point, we see how effective it is, and based on lessons learned, we improve it. That's the only way forward. So yeah, I mean, certainly the important aspect is important. The dashboarding is also, and how we can automate as much of it to provide metrics, as Chase said, is, is forthcoming at some point. So I think the two combined should get us to that level. And you can continually tune things of performance and, uh, you might say, and, and usefulness as we go on. Right. <clears throat> Any other thoughts on this? Hey, Chris, this is Mick. Um, just uh, would it make sense to kind of split this into two pieces? Like, the, I mean, a lot of the stuff I heard Tracy describing in there that's in the list is is stuff that we could automate collection of, you know, write the scripts that are necessary. Um, but if we set up a set of criteria that, you know, if, you know, per Leonard's comment about the dashboard, if you end up with something that shows red in your dashboard, then that triggers a deeper review or um, right. some deeper reporting. Would that make sense? I mean, I just, I, man, I hate filling out monthly status reports for anything that way. Yeah. When it, when it feels like I'm clicking the exact same box every time. Right. I, 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 I tend to agree very strongly with that. And that's why, you know, I focus on, putting together some sort of a dashboard that, you know, is reflective of the various measures that I think are, are meaningful for someone to understand how things are going. Um, uh, and, you know, spending less time on pulling together and putting together a status report and being able to focus more on getting stuff done. Um, and so I, I do tend to agree. And again, yeah, if, you know, somebody goes into the red, then, you know, then obviously, then we have to take a closer look and we have to understand why is it and and so forth. Whereas if everything is green, well, you know, then there's maybe only need for a periodic update where, you know, we can have a congressional grilling <laughs> part of the TSC. <laughs> As long as your measures are accurate. <laughs> well, I think that, you know, that, that's sort of the point is that what we should maybe look at is in the context of, um, Tracy's proposal, uh, and, and I, I saw in chat a couple of questions about, you know, is the, you know, the number of maintainers, uh, you know, added or whatever, a good measure of health, or is it just a number, right? Um, diversity, obviously, is an important thing that we should be measuring both of contributors and maintainers and, um, and so forth. But you know, again, all those things can probably be fairly easily um, uh, measured automatically and captured in some sort of a dashboard. And if we want to make it, you know, private to the TSC, I suppose we could do that. But all I, I think, you know, it tends to be that most of these things, you actually want full transparency and, and not secrecy. And so therefore, you know, I think we should be asking ourselves the tough questions of, so what do we think makes a healthy project? and how do we measure it um, <clears throat> objectively as opposed to subjectively? I totally agree. Well, let's get started. <laughs> so here's what I would propose then. I would propose we take this to the mailing list and um, and we go through and we actually try and, and, and capture, you know, what are the, the measures that we would be looking to ascertain the, the health and, and, um, and uh, the strength, if you will, the diversity of the, the project. Okay, Chris, I can, uh, I can kick that uh, off on the mailing list and uh, look for responses uh, since I've already have a few thoughts on that one. Good. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? If not, then next up is Dave. Dr. No. 
<laughs> or not Dr. No. Not Dr. Not no. Dr. No. <laughs> Coach No. Professor No. Um, all right. So I'm going to make this quick. Um, just a quick status report. I would have sent out more detailed information, although we're we're in the um, sort of the negotiation phases of statement of works, and and didn't want to make that public just yet. Um, but we've received. Uh, so to back up, um, <clears throat> as part of the 1.0 release, um, uh, we engaged with several security auditing firms that are going to do a code review and uh, pen testing for us just to get to establish a floor um it's kind of a uh, just have somebody outside of of the maintainers uh take a look at the code and do audits for security best practices and crypto material handling and uh, network pen testing and things like that um we've talked to netitude secureworks and rapid seven I have a really great statement of work proposal from Netitude, um, and the numbers are reasonable, it seems. Um, SecureWorks is due back. They've said last night, but I haven't heard from them yet uh, today or tomorrow, hopefully. I just emailed them this morning just to prod them a little bit, asking for an update. Um, Rapid7 is evaluating our code base as well, or just you know trying to put together a statement of work for us. So, um, all that's inbound soon. Um, and anyway, uh, once we have the numbers, we're gonna, I, I was hoping to get something so that we could present it, we could come up with a recommendation and get it to the governing board on Monday, but I don't know that that's gonna happen unless we choose to decide to go with um, Netitude um, without looking at other bids, but I, I think that's irresponsible um, for the project. So. Uh, I'm going to see if I can get something with SecureWorks today, and then I'll send it around to the people, you know, here at Hyperledger, make the decision. Um, once it gets going, they, the, so far we've seen that there's going to be like a two to three week staffing lead time to get going, and then the estimates for completion are anywhere between four and six weeks. So there is a significant time investment for this that's going to delay releases. Uh, we had a meeting about Fabric 1.0 release yesterday um, to talk about the security scans because IBM has done one against Fabric as well, and we're, I'm still waiting to see the, the results on that. If that was done you know, thorough enough and the maintainers like it and it looks like we were doing all the right things, I think we could um, use that security scan in lieu of the one that I've initiated um, and not hold up the Fabric 1.0 release. Uh, but that remains to be seen. We're going to have to look at those, and I'll report back when we have seen them. Um, but once it gets going, then I plan to, to convene the first meeting of the security bug triage group to start fielding the issues as they come in from the audits um, and working through our security bug handling process so we can get all of the, the kinks out of that um, and to just get the communication channel set up and make sure that security bug flagging in Jira works and all that stuff. So um, that's, that's the current status right now. I'm pushing pretty hard to get statement of work out of these companies um, so that we can get moving on it. Uh, I don't anticipate. Uh, so Brian's asked me, do you think that this should be something we should do annually? Um, in my professional opinion, <laughs> I would say uh, no, because I would just like to, establish a baseline and then if we do careful change management and we do the right things we have a good process in place we should be able to maintain the integrity of the code base um, that we gain from this kind of a scan, a scan but if we do significant rewrites where we throw out large chunks of code and rewrite things from scratch maybe we should consider it in the future i, I wouldn't completely write it off but um but yeah uh that's pretty maybe much all i we do it for every major release yeah, I don't think there's a requirement for it, but um, for an outside firm to do it. But right. yes, I think I think the CII badge requirements say that we need to do like an uh, an audit of the code for every major release, and that could be an internal one too, um, security team or or things like that. So, um, yeah, that's the current status. Any questions? Uh, Dave, are there any tools out there on the market, proprietary or sort of? Uh, <laughs> 
um, I almost said shareware, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Um, that could automatically go through the core code and provide us, you might say, uh, some form of benchmark testing starts to security calls or holes that we find within code within software. Um, I'm not sure I understood your question. Are you asking if we've used any tools to do? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that can go through the code and give you a report in terms of its finding based on um, security or even a, well, security aspects like are there any backdoors? Are there any areas that we should look at closer? Because yeah. the code may also be copy written. Um, so Yes, we have applied some tools there. Uh, we've been focusing mostly on the continuous integration modifications. So doing fuzzing or doing um, static code analysis at this point, we don't have any dynamic code analysis in place. Um, and that's what the security audit's going to do for us. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know that it'll pinpoint areas of code that we need to look closer at, but just from a security best practices, you, you always want to look at your crypto code, you always want to look at the code that handles data coming from untrusted sources, and you need to look at the code that establishes your quote unquote sandbox, you know, like what's your file IO library look like, what is your, you know, your process management library look like, things like that. So, so are you saying that um, um, you just mentioned part of the static code review that we do now? Um, uh, no, I don't think that they, I don't think any static tool knows how to look at how you're using, say, like this, the salt crypto library, right? There's some best practices no, I mean, out there, but. I mean manually, um, statically, because we talked about statically. Are we manually looking at these categories um, uh, that you just mentioned? Um, I think so. I've, I've got a different version of that question, Dave. Um, yeah. So actually, first, um, we were getting some questions from one of the vendors about lines of code. So just out of curiosity, is that a part of the the billing mechanism for them or the, the cost? Um, I don't believe. Well, yeah, I mean, yes, but not directly. I don't think they bill per line of code. I think they are just trying to assess the, the volume of code so that they can give an estimate on cost and time. Um, okay. Because ultimately, so these parse kind of heavily into you know what was test code versus what was the mainline code and stuff. So yeah, I there's, don't know how precise to get with them. Um, just give them some rough numbers. I don't. I wouldn't give them because I think what they're trying to do is just to get a, a idea of how big it is. Plus, they can drive some metrics like how much coverage of the, co the code have we done based on our fuzzing you know you can see how many lines of code they've activated so they can say oh no we've covered 90 percent of the code with our fuzzing um but i don't i don't think they need exact numbers i think they just wanted to know what areas we wanted them to focus on and like how many lines of code that is okay cool and then um maybe you can help me understand a little, little bit the difference between uh their objectives across uh, I guess there's a couple different ways to define dynamic testing versus pen testing or dynamic analysis versus pen testing. Mm -hmm. So when I think of pen testing, I'm often thinking of uh, like a live production site. And so all of our, our platform software could be deployed in a variety of conditions with, you know, uh, you know all sorts of different firewall settings. Um, and, and that kind of deployment scenario is going to be uh, you know, very specific to a, a certain customer, a certain deployment model. Yeah, so um, when it comes to the pen testing stuff, uh, I'm going to have to deliver to them or the teams are going to have to deliver to them sort of the recommended install um, and the, basically the default install. Um, and then that's what they will pen test from in terms of like network attacking, like can we can we mess with the with the software over the network? or you know locally with files and things like that so um that i hope that answers that part of the question but when it comes to dynamic analysis that is part pen testing right because it's mostly fuzzing i guess is what i'm getting at here so they they yeah. will send random data or carefully guided random data um, and see how deeply they can penetrate into the, the executable um 
and if they can get it to get into bad states or, or do bad things. Um, that actually can be translated into a CI system. So working with Roja, they because they use C++, they have the ability to use American Fuzzy Lock, which is a, a machine learning guided fuzzing tool, which um, maximizes code coverage and does a guided random fuzzing, um, but it's guided by an AI driven by uh, code coverage. So they actually have quite an advantage by using something like C or C++ um, because their fuzzing is going to be a lot more thorough and a lot more, um, I don't know, yeah, thorough, <laughs> I guess is the right word. Um, and I'm hoping to get that into the CI system. So these security scans are going to do a fuzzing pass and I'm hoping to get from them. Uh, and I, I'm just going to start that discussion once we picked one of them uh, about getting their fuzzing harnesses set up as part of our CI. Cause a lot of these fuzzing things, they'll, they'll write some code to do the fuzzing. And I don't know if we'll get that from them, but since it's an open source project, I might be able to, you know, plea for help, right? Can you open source the fuzzing code and, and commit it to the code base for us so that we can use it in our fuzzing in the future? Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that helps. Um, and so when it comes to the, the pen testing half of it, uh, you don't necessarily have to answer here, but if you want to send out some guidance on, uh, or maybe we should have some discussion what, what the expectations are for hosting environments for that pen testing or are the project supposed to set aside some some sprint time to set up an example deployments um, so that's available for the pen testers or you know what, what your thoughts are there um, okay so it just depends on the the company that we're working with I think Netitude said that they could set some stuff up but they were wondering if we had assets already set up for them um, so the answer is either, right? Whichever way works best. Um, they are going to need to know how to set one up, right? And that would yeah. mean that we need to document sort of the default install um, if they if we have them do it. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? So, I mean, I would say, yeah, you probably put a, uh, a, a little bit of time aside to at least support them if they're going to set something up. Something up. And if you need uh, resources to set something up, then let me know. We'll, I'll see if I can line something up for you. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other yeah, questions? One, one, one thing I just wanted to add. Um, so, uh, you know, we've established that a, uh, a code scan like this, uh, and with, I guess pen testing is a cherry on top, is a requirement um, for projects that go to a 1.0, right? And, yeah. um, and, and, and this is something that I believe it's important for us to fund from the Linux Foundation side for two reasons. One is make sure that we can provide kind of that independent audit um, uh, you know, separate from, from, you know, what, what, a, what kind of we expect many of you will be doing internally as well, or perhaps even hiring your own teams, uh, to go off and do, uh, and secondly, to make sure that, you know, all projects at Hyperledger get at least a baseline scan like this, you know, so it's not a question of some projects being better funded than others. It's something that if we put a project out there, Hyperledger, anything 1.0, people should expect it's had a code scan at the least, right? Um, uh, we expect others to do their own scans ahead of time, and it may be that for a 1.0 one, a 1 release or a something dot .0 release that the maintainers on that project actually, you know, feel pretty comfortable that the scans, you know, separate from these meet that requirement. So, um, you know, this will take time to do right for, for the three projects that are heading to a 1.0 right now. And um, I think if those communities are comfortable with the scanning they're, they're doing, the maintainers on those projects, and they vote and, and they, you know, we've, we've responded, we've, we've closed the holes that those scans have found, um, we want to push a release, we wouldn't hold up a 1.0 release for what is likely here to still be a multi-month process, right? Um, but uh, we should still do it. Uh, we should still, you know, see if they turn up anything new that the previous scans didn't and address them. Um, but I, but I, I just want to be clear, we don't want to introduce this, um, getting started on this now, which we are, as a hold up to, you know, one or more of our projects wanting to get to a 1.0. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Or did I muddy the waters here? <laughs> no, no, I think, I think you're, 
I think you're spot on. Okay. Uh, no, that's good, Brian, because it's that Brian who's speaking. I think you, you're talking about strategy, which sort of lines to the process we have in place um, going forward. So, no, that helps with the direction. Um, certainly, the code scan is an important aspect based on our level of maturity we have today <coughs> within Pipe Electric, as well as ensuring that whatever we put out there, a one dot zero otherwise, is uh, with that due diligence. Because our overriding principle for any project is that it's got to be both as uh, very scalable and secure. So these two aspects must be applied. So uh, thanks uh, for the self -run. Any others on the on the TFC have thoughts about about this? Okay, well, Dave is going to push, continue to push forward on getting something like this signed, and and uh, and we'll 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 get the budget for it. Um, I just want to uh, make make it clear to folks that you know we uh, we we know many of the teams are barreling to a one dot release, and want to support them in that. Yep. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> Anything else? If not, I will see some of you. Um, uh, in China. Enjoy. Oh, one thing I should add, I think for those of you lucky people going off to China, you should all bring back a photo album of sorts that we can put together a collage for every hand press irrespective of where. I think that's very good for the entire membership. <laughs> uh, thanks, guys. <laughs> Have a good day, everyone. Bye. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. 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 Everyone.